Cambridge Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala rasulillah, wa alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Rabbi yassir wa a'in ya kareem, wa iftah bil haqqi innaka al-fattahu al-alim. As we move through the uh, fasting days and nights, shifting, as we said last time, from linear time to cyclical time, reconnecting with our biological dependencies and our rootedness in the, the, the cosmic order, uh, we find that certain things become uh, thrown into relief for us. Some of these are internal, as we realize our own weakness and our brokenness, our da'af, our inkisar, we recognize the reality of our depend uh, dependence on the Creator, the Razak, the Baqi. Uh, as we uh, contemplate the natural world, we recognize the divine qualities of beauty, of power, of eternity. As also we engage with others, we come to understand ourselves better. Adinu Mu'amala, religion is interaction with others. Ours is not, by and large, the kind of tradition where there can be permanent khalwa, permanent isolation. Instead, even though all human beings are, in a sense, islands uh, in a great sea, and we can never fully overlap with another person's needs or consciousness, uh, our aloneness only becomes bearable and also fruitful when that aloneness is conjoined with the existence of other souls. We are social animals. And every aspect of the sunnah is a collective one. None of the five pillars of Islam or the principles of our ibadah are really solitary. Some of the nawafil are solitary, the tahajjud perhaps, or optional fasting perhaps. Nobody ever knows that you did it. Uh, or sadaqa. But essentially, all of our basic practices are in engagement with other human subjects. So the zakat is for the ummah, and specifically for uh, the masakin, wa bani sabil, wa riqab, all of these categories of needy people. And through uh, the effulgence of our wealth upon them, we experience a purification and a blessing. Similarly, fasting, even though it is this solo act, nonetheless, we experience it as the most collective time of the year. That it is about the family coming together for suhoor and prayers, the family coming together, or perhaps the whole congregation coming together for the iftar, and then the evening meal, and then the tarawih, which is emphatically a collective act, and then the Eid itself, where the whole Ummah rejoices together and Ramadan ends the final moment that is specifically a Ramadan act with the final embrace with your brethren on the day of the Eid and then it's just back to the normal humdrum round of daily existence. The last moment of Ramadan is an embrace. Ramadan is when we embrace others in solidarity, recognizing the shared fact of our mortality and our weakness and the gratitude that comes from breaking bread together. Ramadan is also a time when we individually and collectively experience the feast that is God's book. The Hadith calls it Ma'dabatullah, God's banquet. And as we sit together, or we stand together in the Tarawih, hearing the voice of eternity, we know that as a collectivity, we receive it more surely than if it was just one person standing alone. So, yes, a time of sociality, even though fasting seems to be the most individual of acts. And Ramadan would be hard to imagine without that bringing together of families, communities, neighborhoods, and souls. Uh, one important aspect of this that we need to give special thought to if we are living in minority situations in the modern West is the question of neighbors. Mm -hmm. uh, the famous hadith in Bukhari and Muslim, it's an Abu Huraira hadith, where the Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, uh, Man kana yu'min billahi wal yawm al-akhir, 
فَلْيَقُلْ خَيْرًا أَوْ لِيَصْمُتْ Whoever believes in Allah and the last day, let him say what is good or hold his peace, which is a particularly Ramadan type of principle when the teeth really do have to be the bars of the, 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 the tiger's cage of the mouth and stopping all of the animal uh, predatory utterances coming out. Uh, but the hadith has several variants, and another variant, uh, which is also a sound variant, is فَلْيُكْرِمْ jarahu, And another one, فَلْيُكْرِمْ ضَيْفَهُ So whoever believes in Allah and the last day, let him honour his neighbour. And in the other version, let him honour his guest. These are basic ancient Abrahamic principles that religion is not just a treasure in the soul, but a shining treasure that should uh, that should be radiant upon neighbours, family, all humanity. So the solitary voyage of Hajar and Ismail to the southern sanctuary, word in Ghairi di Zara, such a lonely experience, becomes the basis for the Umm al-Qura, the mother of cities, and the basis for the Hajj. It's a little bit like the fasting day which we traverse to an arduous desert and then we come to the congregation as well as to the joy, the farha of the ending of the fast. But then we find also that this principle of neighbourliness is accentuated and underlined and it's particularly significant in Ramadan because who is the neighbour? This idea of the jar comes up a lot in the hadith. It's an important part of Islamic ethics, not just being nice to neighbours, but the hadith prefers the phrase ikramul jar, to honour the neighbour. Uh, and the famous uh, saying from Al-Hassan al-Basri says uh, that laysa husnul jiwari kafful aidi walakinna husnul jiwari ihtimalul adha. Being a good neighbour doesn't just mean not doing things that annoy them, being a good neighbour means putting up with the things that they do that annoy you. It's part of the ihtimal, part of the tolerance of being a neighbour, that however loud their domestic arguments might be, or playing music late at night, or revving their engines late at night, the believer tries to overcome that for the sake of good neighbourliness. And this is normal as a part of ethics in any civilization, but particularly emphasised in Islam. Other interesting things that if you look at this question of neighbourliness in Islam come up and are really emphasised by the prophetic wisdom. مَنْ كَانَ لَهُ جَارٌ فِي حَائِطْ أَوْ شَرِيكٌ فَلَا يَبِعْهُ حَتَّى يَعْرِضَهُ عَلَيْهُ It's interesting in the modern sort of turbulent brexit property market in England that the Holy Prophet والسلام, says whoever has a patch of land or a garden with a ba- shared boundary with a neighbour should not sell his land until he offers it for sale to his neighbour first. An interesting principle, because the neighbour may have some particular advantage in gaining that land, natural lights or uh, 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 an extension in his garden or whatever, and this might facilitate things for him. So this is part of the prophetic commandment, part of the prophetic ethos of being actively benign to neighbours. Don't just sell your house to some stranger, but talk to your neighbours about it beforehand because it's uh, an important event in the life of the street, in the neighbourhood, that's going to impact upon them as well. (coughs) Similarly, another hadith says uh, that if your neighbour has a wall uh, which has wooden parts adjacent to your own site, in other words, along the the boundaries, then the neighbour has the right to enter your property in order to fix that wall and to put in nails in, in that wood. So there's a lot of material about uh, Hosn al-Jiwar that is absolutely uh, important and relevant in today's context. And in the kind of Ramadan environment, we need to think particularly about this. Too often with our mosques, we find everybody comes out having done their duty, sweated through a hot tarawih for two hours, and they come out and immediately they're laughing on the street, they're slamming their car doors, revving their engines, calling out to each other, socialising in front of neighbours' houses, and this is not Islamic. Ahsin mujawarata man jawarak takun musliman, the Holy Prophet says. To be a good Muslim 
just says to be a Muslim, be a good neighbor to your neighbors. Takun Muslima. If you want to be a Muslim, be a good neighbor. So what is the point of staying for those 20 rakahs and for the qunut and for the bayan afterwards and for whatever else might be going on, having fasted arduously all day, if the last thing that you do in the day is to slam the car door and to annoy the neighbors. And if it's, you know, they have to get up early in the morning to go to work and they're being disturbed at 11.30, 12 o'clock at night, every night by those pesky Muslims, this is unfortunate. A mosque should be a blessing to the neighborhood, not a source of complaint and irritation. This is a very widespread issue that we should respect neighbors. But getting back to the question of who is the neighbor, is anybody who lives nearby a neighbor? Well, uh, essentially, yes, that is the Sharia position. It, the, a neighbor doesn't have to be a Muslim in order to be a neighbor. So the Holy Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam qala idha dhabahu shatan hal ahdaytu minha li jarika al-yahudi thalatha marrat the Holy Prophet said when he heard that somebody had slaughtered a sheep, have you given some to your Jewish neighbor? And he says it's three times. It's as if he's going out of his way to indicate the fact that even though there may be problems with other communities in Medina, given the politics of the situation, uh, they're still your neighbors and <coughs> they still have the right to a share in uh, the food that you are cooking. This is part of traditional hospitality and neighborliness in uh, Muslim cities, histor historically speaking, that you always share food, especially when whole sheep or something has been slaughtered and there's, there's an abundance. So this, this is important. The interesting Quranic verses that speak of وَالْجَارِ ذِي الْقُرْبَى وَالْجَارِ junub, which is a little hard to understand perhaps, the near neighbor and the far neighbor, or perhaps the strange neighbor, الْجَارِ junub. And if you look at the ulama of tafsir, they say different things about this. Some say, oh, it means somebody who is physically close to you, and the fiqh generally describes the neighbor in this technical sense as the nearest 40 houses to your house, uh, whereas the strange neighbor or the far neighbor is somebody from further away who has fewer hukuk because they're out of earshot and, and further. That's one possible interpretation. Another is that if your neighbor is also a family member, Qarib uh, in that sense, then they have more rights. But another sense is that it means the Muslim neighbor and the non-Muslim neighbor. And this is accepted by the Mufassirun. Mm. So there is the near neighbor and the strange neighbor, but they're all neighbors. They're all jiran and they participate in this uh, act of hospitality. Because after all, is this not what Sayyidina Ibrahim Khalilullah did when the Qawmun Munkarun, the strangers, came to his tent and his wife's tent? Huh? They were afraid of them, but uh, they gave them the ajl samin, the fatted calf, the best. Even though they were strangers, they could have been enemies. Who knows who they were, but still the believer's uh, need is for hospitality, which is this meaning of ikram, being hospitable and honoring people. When you have a guest, you do not just sit around and expect them to help themselves from the fridge. No, you honor them. You become the servant, you become the waiter as well as the cook, and you honor them. And this is part of basic hospitality, and this evidently applies irrespective of religious boundaries. Naturally, there is a certain closeness if they are also Muslims. There is a certain softness and mutual understanding that is understandable and necessary. If they are family members, ditto. So this is the jar, du thalathati hukuk, that they speak of, the neighbor with three rights, the neighbor who is physically near, who is also a family member and is also a Muslim. But the others, lahum haq wahid, they also have a right. So this is something that we need to think about. And it doesn't just mean not revving the car engine after tarawih, but it means a whole load of other things. If you want to move into a neighborhood, for instance, think about what impact that's going to have, not just on you, but on other people in the street. If you want a loft conversion, or to paint the color of your front door, something different, or anything like that, that neighbors might have a say in, try and find out what they like and consult with them. And this is part of the adab of Husn al-Jiwar in Islam. It is really important. And if you wish Islam to be loved, that's gonna be hard if they don't love you. Maybe it's the only Muslim on the street. You have to be exemplary. You have to look out for the neighbors who are perhaps alone. You have to keep an eye on their children. You have to make sure that their pets are well looked after. 
the hadith says, إِذَا رَمَيْتَ كَلْبَ جَارِكَ فَقَدْ آذَيْتَ If you throw something at your neighbor's dog, you've hurt your neighbor. It's just the dog, but still, they have this haq. And this is another thing that we need to bear in mind. We need to be good neighbors. We need to be popular neighbors. We need to be caring, thoughtful neighbors. We need to keep an eye on their houses when they're away, feed their pets when they're away, watch out for their cars, whatever it might be. Neighborhood watch, we should be there as Muslims. And that way, the reputation of the Ummah will be enhanced. And the same comes, uh, the same comes into play with mosques as well, with mosque design. If you're designing a new mosque, make sure that you know how to make the neighbors love it. Don't think that this is some kind of defiant gesture of foreignness that you have to make and you really don't care if they hate the look of it each time they cycle past. That's not hostile jiwar. Beauty is important in Islam. Mosques historically are beautiful. Try and make sure that you do something beautiful that will make the neighbors love the mosque, that will make them love you, that will make them love the jama'ah, and will make them love the religion of Islam. Don't build something cheap, tacky, defiantly different that is, as it were, a statement of what you take to be the superiority of Kurdish culture, Turkish culture, Indonesian culture, whatever it might be, because that's not good adab. That's not good adab. Uh, and we need to recognize this. So all of these are particularly Ramadan principles because of the mystery of Ramadan, which puts us in the crowd in a solitary state uh, but engages the soul in the life of others. It's during those Ramadan meals that we really want to make sure that other people have the dates and the water and we become servants, as we should be all of the year, but we, as it were, return to the normal Muslim fitra at this time when we are uh, properly engaging with ikram of others. And this is one of the subtle adab of the fasting month, uh, the courtesies of it. And the Holy Prophet says, Adabani Rabbi, my Lord gave me my adab and gave me beautiful adab. And the believer, though he does his ibadah and has his aqidah and all of the other things, if he doesn't have these subtler things, courtesy with others, with neighbors, with family, with friends, with Bani Adam, with passers-by, if he isn't a person of adab with those people, then he isn't really getting it right. That the inward transformation that the prayer and the fast uh, invite him to has not actually taken place because he's still ghaliz. Hmm. Remember the rather alarming hadith in which it was said, Ya Rasulullah, inna fulanatan tasumu nahar wa taqumu layl wa tu'thi jiranaha. There's this woman who fasts every day and stays up at night standing in prayer, but she says things that annoy her neighbors. And he says, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, hiya fin nar, she is in hell. So don't think that these other adab are insignificant. They're very fundamental in our salvation. And we need to be people of good adab, and we need to be good neighbors, because we have to be people of da'wah, because this is a, a, an inevitable, unavoidable aspect of the sunnah. We can never be indifferent to how we are seen, because we can never be indifferent to how Allah's religion, which we represent, is seen. We're people of da'wah all the time, particularly if we live in minority situations. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make this a Ramadan of fine adab, of concern for others, of feeding others, of honoring others, and of good neighborliness, inshallah, so that we may be once again khayra ummatin ukhrijat linnas, the best ummah raised up for mankind. Barakallahu feekum, wal afu minkum, wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah. Cambridge Muslim College, training the next generation of Muslim thinkers.